my guest today is Kendra Fry. Um, before we jump into her presentation, I have a few things to share with you first, but I wanted to begin by inviting her to introduce herself. So, Kendra, I know you're the, you're the administrator at St. Paul's United Church in Toronto. Uh, tell us what brings you into this call and, and uh, uh, why you're here today. Sure. Uh, thanks for having me, Stephen. Uh, I wear an awful lot of hats. So uh, one of the things I am is the general manager of Trinity St. Paul's Center for Faith, Justice and the Arts, otherwise known as Trinity St. Paul's United Church, depending on the day, here in Toronto. Uh, I also work with Faith and the Common Good and the National Trust for Canada on a project called Regeneration Works. And Regeneration Works is interested in the position of our historic and non-historic faith buildings all across Canada and how we keep them in uh, action and activity for communities of faith and communities at large. So I work with them on actually many of the people who are present here today. I've worked with on that. So that's the two hats which, uh, with which I come to you today. Thank you. And one of the things I know about Trinity St. Paul's is that you have so many other community groups who lease space from the church. I mean, lots of us have a daycare in the building, lots of us have dance classes in the afternoon, but you have a kind of expertise in managing property that, uh, that uh, swamps mine, and, and you struggle with how to juggle all of the needs of all those different groups. So that's, I think, part of the expertise you bring in that I'm, I'm looking to you for today. Nice. Yeah, I mean, Trinity St. Paul's has uh, 14 tenants, so who are with us every day, 60 home companies, so 60 companies who do the majority of their work with us, and a further 483 user groups um, who work with us throughout the course of the year. So yeah, that's, uh, that's what we're looking at right now, 483 groups to figure out. So as a property manager, then you're looking at reopening your building, not just for worship purposes, but for all of those tenants. And how do you keep them all safe? And how do you keep them all apart from each other? And how do you take all of their needs seriously? That's huge. Yeah, um, I mean, it's uh, been a journey and we're looking at it step by step, um, trying to imagine what will come next and uh, uh, taking it piece by piece and certainly the larger pieces. So everything that happens in the sanctuary, I'm sorry to say, is uh, much further down the line than uh, what happens in the daycare and the offices, which is where we're uh, at right now is figuring out the, the fine details of that and looking towards what it might look like when we get to larger gatherings. Well, that's important, and, and, and that really is the focus of today's uh, program. We, there are so many different ways we use our buildings as church leaders, but today's program, we really wanted to focus on, on the property issues that are at stake. We're going to look at some programmatic issues, of worship issues, those kinds of things next week, provided all the leaders fall into place and so on. And, my goodness, I usually take six weeks to plan a webinar, not three days. Yeah, but uh, <laughs> it's been a journey this, this last 10, day, 10 weeks. But, uh, but today we wanted to talk about our buildings as property and churches as, as landlords and as property managers. And when we started planning this webinar, we first of all reached out to the public health officials and we said to them, we are, as church leaders across the country, starting to try to figure out what pieces do we need to put in place so that when it comes time to open our buildings, uh, we'll be safe. Could you come on to a webinar and, and uh, help us start to think about that? And we talked to, oh, several public health departments across the country with that request. And they all said, nope, not time yet. They said churches, even daycares are so far down the list, we have to deal with the people we need to deal with right now, we don't have time to help you. So that was a bit of a wake up call right there to say it's not even time for us to start thinking about it yet. Hmm, we decided we were gonna go ahead anyway. And one of the, the folks on today's webinar pointed me to a, a program that was being hosted by World Vision and by a bunch of other groups associated with World Vision uh, and had been heavily marketed within the evangelical churches across the country. Uh, and the host there was the chief medical officer for Nova Scotia. Uh, so they asked him to kind of 
set the lay of the land. Uh, I guess because they had 2,000 on their webinar, 3,000 registered, uh, he was willing to say yes, whereas I could only promise about 250. Um, but I wanted to share with you just a few of the slides that he put into his webinar with folks as a way of kind of laying the land. Now, I am not Dr. Robert Strang. I can't answer your questions about public health the way that he did. But I can at least share with you a few of his slides and a few of the things he wanted church people to be thinking about as, as they begin this conversation. And I need to acknowledge he's very clearly a church person. Uh, he at several points talked about uh, uh, sermons that his pastor had made. So he understands church. He understands what church is about. He can talk the language. It's clearly personally important to him. And yet he's the chief medical officer of health for, for the province of Nova Scotia. He's been on, on a national advisory panel to, to create guidelines. He's very aware of, of all of the different guidelines in all of the different provinces and where they're similar and where they're different. And, and his first piece of advice to, to the audience this afternoon always was, check with your provincial authorities. It's different in every province. Agreed. Very, very important. But having said that, let me share you just with you just a little bit of, of uh, uh, the way he set the scene for us. So the first thing he said was that we cannot pretend that this is over. The pandemic is not over. We are maybe coming to the end of the first wave. That's it, that's all. There will be another wave and another wave. And this is gonna go up and down and up and down probably for one or two years, he said. And we need to be prepared for that and planning for that and not surprised by that. He's saying the same thing that every other public health official I've heard over the last eight weeks has been saying, full control of this virus is not going to be available until there's herd immunity and that may never happen. It could be that this virus will turn out to be like the flu where we just live with it because the kinds of antibodies we develop don't protect us from it completely. So it could be that it's with us forever now. And that we need to recognize that whatever our new normal is going to look like, we are not going back to 2019. This was not a message that his evangelical church audience wanted to hear. I don't think it's a message we want to hear either. But we need to hear it because we need to plan for it. He said, we need to find a balance between increasing our economic and social activity, and by social activity, he means church activities, and keeping people safe. If we can't do both, life is going to be pretty grim, right? And so the only tools we have at our disposal are the ones that the authorities keep talking about. Surveillance, testing, public uh, contact tracing, public health follow-up, all of those kinds of things. We need to be imagining what it means to be church, having tenants in our buildings, having meetings and worship services in our buildings, recognizing that we're living with this disease for a couple of years, probably. It's not going to be over in September. And so he rehearsed with us. Here's the list, and he said every province is different, but here's the list of of generally of the order of different things that are going to resume and they're going to come in and out as things get safe or as outbreaks happen but they begin by allowing some businesses to happen and lots of places that's starting to happen now schools daycares will probably be fairly high on the list but look where churches fall pretty much right at the bottom and he was imagining that we might be able to use our sanctuaries for small gatherings like funerals long before we have regular Sunday morning services. It's important for us to think about, I think. Whatever we do, and all the way through all the different phases of reopening, those are the four pieces of public health advice that are crucial to keep, keeping people safe. Even when everything's open, physical distancing is going to be essential till we have a vaccine or herd immunity. 
extra cleaning beyond what we're used to is going to be essential. Ventilation of public spaces and workplaces. Practicing good hygiene, hand washing, avoid touching face, coughing into your sleeve. All of that advice we've been hearing since January, staying at home for the next two years, not just for the next two months. Everything we do as churches and everything we do in our buildings has to take these tools into account because they're the only ones we got. So stay informed, he says. Consider using a non-medical mask if you can't be six feet apart from everybody. Limit non-essential travel. This all sounds familiar, right? This is the context in which we have to imagine opening our buildings. So I will give you some, um, some uh, resources. I'll put them up on the, on the uh, uh, recording page for our, for our webinar after it's over. He recommended we have a look at the guidelines for worship uh, places from Alberta. He said every, uh, uh, there somebody's put them up on the, uh, on, on the Zoom chat here. He said every, every province has them, but he thought the ones from Alberta were most complete and easiest to understand. Uh, but he said they were all excellent. And uh, uh, so go and have a look at the guidelines for worship places in your own province. And then go and have a look at the ones from Alberta because they may be a little more complete. Uh, but it's important to, uh, to to realize the context that we're living in and some of the resources that are that are emerging because of that. So I've been talking. I, I can't read the chat. Kendra, are, is there anything there that we need to kind of uh, respond to before we switch gears and move away from the public health context into your thoughts on church buildings? Yeah, lots of good things happening in the chat, Stephen, including an offer from someone on the chat who is, in fact, a public health management expert whose email I now have for the next level of this. Perfect. Thank you. Um, yeah, so that's brilliant. Use our own resources, right? Work together to figure these things out together. And then the reference there to Alberta, hugely helpful. Yes. Uh, Lynn, I see your request about webinar on custodians on how to clean properly and safely. In actual fact, I was at a meeting with the large faith property managers in the Ontario region yesterday, mm -hmm. and the guy who's kind of the expert on that is putting that together as well. So mm -hmm. um, there's lots of people working on lots of things, and to, together we'll get there. Um, mm -hmm. Today's framework, as mentioned, is not directive um, we are questioning in order to help us to start thinking through the processes. And then as we gather more information, we'll be providing more direction on what we think you should be doing. Today is more about how should we think about this process than what precisely one should do. Does that seem accurate, Stephen? I think that's, that's essential. And if we're taking seriously uh, the advice from, from all of our officials, including Dr. Strang, um, we need to start to think our way into this, but nobody has all the answers yet. Yeah. And I also found the Alberta guidelines quite helpful in the thought process. So do have a quick look at those. I will remind everyone because we must all remind ourselves, Alberta is talking about gatherings of 50. Not every province is talking about gatherings of 50 here in Ontario. We're still at five. So be conscious that uh, we're a, a very big country. Alberta is also saying gatherings of 50 or one third of building capacity, whichever is lower. Exactly. So if your building holds 100, then you're not allowed 50. Exactly. And then just a comment here as well about the indicating the need for liability and insurance coverage. So I was on a National Trust for Canada webinar about this yesterday as well about um, looking at our insurance requirements and thinking about that. And I'm sure there's going to be more coming from UCC out of that as, as we look to uh, the insurance uh, effects. Well, and it's not clear yet what kind of liability property owners may have. Um, certainly, if somebody gets sick, uh, they may be interested in suing a property owner claiming that the building wasn't properly cleaned. So it's possible that there will be liability for us as property holders, but there's no case law yet. Uh, it hasn't happened yet. Um, Dr. Strang was acknowledging that and also saying, let's try to stay creative. 
but be aware of that, that we have a duty of care to everybody who walks through our building. And if we fail in that, we are liable. And on that super sober note, shall we <laughs> questions that we want to ask ourselves as we head towards this new world? One of the things I would say is, so we had this, um, there's this group of very large scale uh, churches cross denominationally that meet in Toronto and they typically meet every six weeks, but we met again yesterday via uh, webinar um, and Faith in the Common Good sponsors that gathering. So I was conducting it yesterday and I went in terrified about advising people and came out reminded that I am part of a community and that mm -hmm. it's not in fact my job to advise people it's my job to collaborate with experts in various regions and bring together our best knowledge and and work as as people of good faith to do the best that we can so um be of good heart we're all working together well and as, as Michelle says on the zoom chat here we have always been liable with respect to safe maintenance of our building yep we had a uh, we had a, a slip and fall in my church about a year ago. Um, somebody fell down the stairs, and uh, the first thing our insurance company wanted to know was was the uh, banister and handrail in good condition. Yep. I think that's about what we've got on the chat. So is this a good moment to go over to the deck and just uh, ask sure. ourselves some questions? Let me let me pull that up for you here, and uh, you can. These are your slides now, so tell us where you want me to go. Let's start from the beginning. All right. To consider in preparation for reopening. So uh, is everybody seeing that? Maybe someone can just give me a quick yes in the chat box so we make sure that our, our sharing is working. Great. Thank you, Laurie. Um, so as I said, uh, we're just talking about thought processes today, not about the actual things to do. As we move further along, we'll start talking about uh, actual uh, you know, cleaning processes and such as, as time moves forward. And the next slide, please. I'm gonna move my chat box out of the way here over to the side. There we go. All right, so in, in thinking about this, remember that the scale of your church and its usage patterns matters, right? So if you are primarily a, a Sunday only church, um, the degree to which you'll have to clean, think about um, all of those kinds of patterns will be changed by the fact that you're only there once a week um, as compared to an, uh, a large scale church. So at, at Trinity St. Paul's, we're looking at about 75 booked hours a day in um, 11 different rooms and then the 14 offices. So that's a different scale. So apply your scale to the questions that we're asking here and think about that. Yeah, I think that's important. And uh, we will about in about uh, 40 minutes have a cleaning company come on to help us think through some of these things. Yep. But one of the things I confirmed with them is that the virus is expected to live on hard surfaces for about 48 to 72 hours. So if all we're doing is worshiping on Sunday morning, our cleaning patterns may not change very much if we're only in once a week. Exactly. But so if we're a church like yours, Kendra, where we've got multiple groups coming in every day, then our cleaning changes dramatically. So what are some of the cleaning changes you're thinking about? Well, all kinds of things for sure. Um, uh, really it's about high touch points, but I think if we go through the slides, we're gonna hit that. So let's have a little look here at that. Yeah. And Heidi, I hear that you're looking for specific things. So we are gonna talk about some specific things. And as, a, as mentioned by Stephen, the, uh, the cleaning company is gonna come on in the second half as well to talk about some more specifics. So there's really two layers of reopening. So there's for your user groups. So if you have tenants that are in your space, daycares, tenants, offices, small user groups. Uh, and in fact, you may have been continuing this whole time. You may not be reopening. You may just be bringing other users back in and have been continuing your food banks and your pastoral care all along. And then for church services, as talked about, church services will likely be very late in being permitted due to a series of factors. So first of all, the, the large gathering sizes of church services, um, the older population. So uh, Stephen and I were laughing about the fact that seniors don't always know that they are seniors. So um, we've got to make sure to protect everyone, uh, whether they know that they're in need of protection of not or not. And then the habits of food and drink and greeting, they increase the risk. So we tend to come to church service and then share coffee and tea and treats and those kinds of things with each other. And that of course, increased the risks. 
Next slide. So let's talk about some categories of concern to consider. So first up is traffic flow. Um, so you'll notice I have a bit of a fondness for pictures of church doors. So I'm just uh, letting myself enjoy uh, pictures of church doors. And I'm sorry, I'm just going to ask my, my child to be silent for a minute there. Hey, doing a webinar. All right. Um, so within the traffic flow, is there a way to create one way traffic flow that discourages meetings in hallways? Could you create arrows indicating directions of travel? Do you have extra doors that could be open at key times to discourage crowding? So as you all were gathering, Stephen and I were talking about that up to this point, when you've talked about your church, you've always wanted to have just one door open so that you could manage the security of everyone. But you may wanna revisit that now and consider all of the various doors and all of the ways in which you could bring people in and out through those doors. Have you considered the possibility of assigned seating for services when allowed? So this is something that Trinity St. Paul's is just at the beginning of. We've done some modeling. Our sanctuary usually seats 755. We're looking at 218 in the new world. And that's 218 uh, divided by doors as well. So the right side of the sanctuary will go in one door and the left side will go in another door and the front third will come in a third and a fourth door. And you'll know in advance what seating area you're going to, and you would be seated with whatever your pod is of people that you've been with to that point. So in twos or threes or fours or ones, however it is that you've been living with spaces of six feet between you and the next group, so. And I think it's important, Kendra, uh, to also add that there may be jurisdictions where you are only allowed one door. I think that's true right now in stage one in Ontario. Really? No commercial establishments are allowed to have more than one door. And, huh. and they have a staff person at the door who's keeping track of the numbers who go in and out. Huh, fascinating. That's, that's, that's why we're standing outside of, of Home Depot or, or Staples or wherever it is we want to shop. They're only allowed one door in and <laughs> one door out. And they, the, the staff person is there in a mask and you often a face shield. Yeah. Keeping track of the numbers because they are not allowed to stay open by the public health authorities if they have one extra person in the room beyond what they're licensed for. Huh. Interesting. Uh, so I don't think I caught that about the single doors right now. So that'll be something to watch as we go forward. Um, you know, if you're looking at single doors, that's going to limit even further the number of people that you can allow to come in. Um, so that's something to think about as well. And Jane is saying, what if we have only one bathroom? Very important. How do, what's the traffic flow from the bathroom into the bathroom? And should we be taking green painter's tape and putting six foot lines down on the floor outside of the bathroom stall as well? Should we be putting uh, uh, sanitizer on the bathroom so that when people are finished with the bathroom, they can wipe off the, the tap handles? That's one of the high traffic areas. Yeah. There are, these, these are very practical kinds of considerations, but yes, it's important. The aisles in my church are so small that we can't have more than one person walking at a time. They'll all have to be six feet apart. And I'm thinking about green painters tape down the aisle. I think that definitely the idea of paint um, to indicate where people should, should stand makes a lot of sense, particularly when you're talking about bathroom lineups where people tend to be less conscious of that. Yeah. Um, we're dealing with one stall bathroom, that's um, challenging to imagine. Are we going to ask people to sanitize everything as they leave? I don't know. I must admit that I, I haven't thought through that one stall bathroom aspect. Um, I do remind you that from all of the reading we've all been doing, uh, the touch services are important, but airborne is more important. Yeah. So things to think about. Yeah. We might well need washroom attendance, Ellen. Yep. Uh, in the same way that we have attendance at the front door of the church, we might need an attendant at the door of each washroom. And yep. maybe the attendant's job to go in and wipe down the taps after somebody's used them before the next person goes in. Yeah. However, if you're only allowed 20 people in church, it's not a big job, right? Yeah, it's a different, a different level for sure. So, yeah. all right, let's have a look at the next slide then. So that's traffic flow. So think a little bit about traffic flow. So yep. at Trinity St. Paul's, we're looking at one-way traffic flow in certain areas and what that looks like. If you go up this set of stairs, then you come down that set of stairs if you're choosing to be on the balcony. Or if you're on the right-hand side of the balcony, you go down the right stairs and out the right door. And if you're on the left, then you go down the left and out the left door. It's the sort of things we're thinking about if we uh, get to that point of being allowed that large of a gathering. 
I think it's important to acknowledge, and let me just interrupt for a second, Kendra. There are no provincial guidelines about these things yet. What Kendra and I are relying on are the provincial guidelines for commercial establishments, because those are the ones that are being published. So when next time you go into Staples, next time you go grocery shopping, next time you go into the dog food store, have a look at what they're doing, because that's what we're relying on. And we are assuming that when people are allowed to come back into churches, we as churches are going to have to have similar protocols. I can't see any reason why that would be false, yeah. but that's what we're relying on. 100%. And uh, yes, of course, my presentation deck can be made available to you to, uh, you know, take to your board or your trustees and ask them the same questions, ask them to think about your own space. And really, that's what we all have to do is look at our own space and envision what usage pattern makes the most sense for it and its scale of usage. So entry protocols, what will you be requiring people to do upon entry? Are you going to be asking them to use hand sanitizers? Are we going to ask them to wear masks? keep their distance and follow directional arrows the way that we're seeing in most of the grocery stores right now. Can uh, you ask them not to utilize kitchens? I'm aware I'm about to get an uprising from the congregation, but that will be the direction at Trinity St. Paul's. There'll be no kitchen use at first because that is too many touch points. And people are really unaware about that when they're managing food, they have a tendency to lick their fingers. They're just not even knowing they're doing it, but they do. Um, are you going to ask them to leave immediately upon their business being finished? So I think about, you know, one of our usage patterns is a, a large group of children dancing and those uh, parents tend to hang out in the hallways, hovering near the window to watch their children dance. Well, the decision's already been made that that's simply not possible anymore. So either that group will have to rent the room next to it for those parents to be in, or the parents will have to go out and wait outside, right? And so you need to think about the interactions of all of the various aspects of your users in all their ways. And let me, let me just add to that the protocols for daycares. And I've been looking into this because we have a daycare in my church. Uh, food must be served in the daycare. Kids are there all day. They have to have lunch. Yep. Food must arrive in the daycare already prepackaged with a child's name on it. Yep. Each child gets their own little brown bag. They're not allowed to share, and it has to be prepared off-site in an approved commercial kitchen. If we're ever going to serve food in churches during this pandemic, I suspect that will be true for us too, which means no kitchen. Yeah. And so cold food, because you can't put a lot of food in a paper bag, right? Yep. So that'll be a, a major, major difference. So yeah. Uh, and then what actions will you take when they don't respect this in order to protect others? So I see in the chat here that um, someone is mentioning that they rent space to different denominations and what if they don't abide by your rules? Uh, we are really adjusting our uh, approach at Trinity St. Paul. So in the past, we've been quite collaborative and work with people and discuss things and multiple warnings and around all of our rules. That's simply not going to be possible anymore. And so we started putting forward the directives that will be, you know, here are the rules that you must sign off on when you sign our user agreement. And you cannot book with us until that user agreement is signed. And if you do not maintain your group according to these rules, then you get one warning and then that's it. Your booking is canceled because this is no longer just about politeness. It's about safety for our mass groups. So um, yeah, exactly. So uh, I see someone here saying making the protocols part of the conditions of rental. Exactly. So we just went to today that it, when you request a booking from Trinity St. Paul's, you now receive your user agreement. And until that user agreement is signed, your booking is not confirmed. Um, I should say your theoretical booking. We're not open. We don't know when we're going to be open. <laughs> theoretically, if you were going to, that would be how that would go. So Lisa is asking, how will the no kitchen work for meals programs run by the church? And I would say probably we're not having them. But if you've got uh, a, an approved and inspected commercial kitchen, there will be protocols just as there are for going to a local restaurant. And if you've got people who are trained in those protocols and following them, um, then it's probably okay but you're gonna to have to follow the same rules as, as Eastside Mario's does. Um, yeah. And you'll be running a restaurant basically. If you've been meeting the public health standards, then you're continuing to meet the public health standards. That hasn't changed. So yeah. 
Um, there are plenty of churches who are continuing to run feeding programs in which they are bagging food and handing it out to people who are then eating off site. And they have been public health inspected this whole time. So. And that's what the food banks are doing too. Yeah. There are lots of food banks that used to say to their guests, come in and choose what you need. Now they're saying, there's bags over there, go and take one. And they're kind of lining people up six or eight feet apart. They can come up and take a bag and leave again. They can't look inside it. So there are those kinds of protocols. Who yep. will pay for these cleaning costs, says Katja? Good question. Yeah, so we ran a survey at Trinity last week and asked if people were willing to pay more and the answer was yes. And so in fact, we have put our rates up to help to cover that cleaning cost. One of the things it's, um, when we get to the cleaning, it it doesn't have to be, it has to be more often. It's not different than before, it's more often. So it's it's people that you're paying for on the cleaning. So yeah, I don't I don't have solid answers, Katja, as you know, but um, if the uh, ability exists, if you are charging renting groups, then I believe that the cost is going to have to go up. And it will be a cost of doing business. Yeah. Let's have a look at the next slide and see what else we're Thank talking you. about here. Yeah, so cleaning protocols, we are going to, as you said, have a cleaning company in who has some thoughts. You should also consult with people locally. We're all going to be gathering more information about this over time, but we encourage you again to think about what is your usage pattern, right? Are we talking about a once a week? Are we talking about a couple of user groups a day? What, what exactly is, is the usage pattern for you? So uh, what high touch points need to be cleaned more? These are not different than before we closed down. I mean, certainly we were in this state for a solid four or five weeks before we closed down as the pandemic grew. So doorknobs, can you prop doors open? This is where uh, we're all getting into a bit of a debate right now in the large scale churches between um, fire door safety and pandemic safety. Mm -hmm. um, I don't actually know where that's going, so I have it in my notes to consult with uh, the fire chief here in Toronto about fire doors and the propping open of doors and if anything has changed in this circumstance, right? Uh, light switches, is it time to install those automatic sensors so people aren't turning them on and off all the time? Um, you know, it depends again on your usage pattern. In Trinity, they mostly just come on and stay on. So it's not actually a touch point, but for many people, there are rooms that are high touch points that go on and off many times a day. Bathrooms, how often will you close them for cleaning? What's reasonable for your particular uh, group? Um, how can you maintain that, right? So if you're there just on Sunday, I don't know that you need to clean it more often than you did before. You may need to think about if there are multiple stalls allowing only every other stall to discourage crowding in the gathering within that joint bathroom. Um, yeah, I don't have an answer for how often we're going to clean them right now. All I can say is more than before. No. And Tina is saying if we already have a rental contract with a price that was quoted, can we increase that? That's where I think you want to talk with a lawyer. Yeah, I don't know on that. I don't know the answer to that either. Because absolutely, you're right. None of us could predict these extra expenses. Yeah, I have no idea. Um, in that's in the to... congregation I serve, we have a Pentecostal congregation that work, that comes into our sanctuary for three o'clock in the afternoon service, which means the sanctuary has to be cleaned after hours and before they come in. Mm -hmm. Normally, we run around and pick up the litter, bulletins and coffee cups, but that's about it. Now we've got to pay a cleaner to come in and sanitize the place. That's that's going to take a bite out of our out of the rent we get from our Pentecostal friends. Yep. And Judas says some businesses are adding a COVID-19 charge onto their buildings, onto their bills. It's true, although it tends to be not huge, but it is it, it's a way to share the cost. Uh, and then do you need to change, in fact, the whole way that you clean? So I was having a bit of a debate with my cleaners the other day, and they were uh, a bit stuck in what we currently do. And I was like, I think we're getting past what we currently do. I think now we're getting into talking about uh, blue light sanitizing for bathrooms, uh, misting sprays. I've not heard of that. What is it? Yeah, blue light sanitizing has been used for uh, a long time. And lately, it actually has been being installed in some of the higher end grocery stores here in Toronto. So there are two levels of blue light sanitizing, one that's safe for people and one that is not. And people are talking about installing into bathrooms the one that is not safe for people so that you shut down the bathroom entirely and blue light sanitize it. So you turn on the blue light, 
which sanitizes it all, and then you reopen after that. Mm -hmm. um, so there's still research to be done into that. I'm in the midst of researching into um, the companies in Korea. There are now some Canadian companies that are being approved by Health Canada that are doing these misting sprays. So like basically tents at the door of your place that you walk through. And this has been being used in South Korea for a little while now in order to reopen um, theaters, in fact. So the company that's coming on to join us at, at uh, the bottom of the hour does a misting spray with a fogger. Yeah. And uh, they've been negotiating with the folks at Buying United to maybe put together clusters of four or five churches that would share the expense. Yep. Now, I would say that you had better be a pretty large scale operation to be considering that level. So we all need to balance um, safety and, and good common sense. Makes sense. I right. agree with you completely. And, um, and, and that's, that's, I mean, we have to leave common sense to the, to the folks who are listening, um, yeah. but that's certainly one of the options to consider. They've been doing fire halls and other high touch places that are used all the time. And, and my comments at the beginning still stand. If the sanctuary is used once a week, not much extra cleaning needs to happen in there. No. But if it's used multiple times a day, you need, to, you need to do something to keep the second and third and fourth group safe. Yeah. So these are just things to think about. Also think about um, the cleaning protocols that come before that. So did you used to spend your, all of your time, like the woman in this picture, mopping floors? Is it time to buy that automated floor washing thing that you ride on or push in front of you so that now you don't mop floors and you do other things? Mm. Um, I just think it's a real time to open up all the boxes of the things you've been doing and not be bound by imagining how you do those things now, but be bound by imagining what is the end game that you're trying to get to and, and how might you achieve that. So should you be buying new tools so that your cleaner can do the jobs that are needed more efficiently is what you're asking. Yep, exactly. Let's have a look at the next slide. Yeah, okay, so now we get to seating considerations and uh, Stephen actually has a, a map that he's gonna share in a second that has done some real mapping for his space. So how will you ensure safe space in your rooms? Are you looking at circles on the ground? Are you removing two or three seats for every one or two seated? So assuming that you're seating in your bubble of people you've been with, how many seats do you need in between in order to achieve that six foot radius? Are you looking at every other row how will you block those off? Um, certainly the days of coming in and sitting wherever you feel like in church are gone. Uh, this is going to be a case where you're going to be directed where you sit and you're going to sit there every time. And likely you're going to enter in that order so that you're not passing each other in the aisles, right? So um, the, the directionality of this becomes quite important. Um, certainly you're going to be reducing the capacity of your rooms. You know, one of our church user groups sent their usual, you know, June note the other day saying, oh, we want to rebook this singing group into the memorial starting in September the following days. And I was like, you are 15 elderly people singing in a room that used to have a capacity of 30 that you can't I be that. in that room singing anymore. Well, I'll be sick. Absolutely. So if you're going to continue singing, which is my first question, are you going to continue singing right now? Uh, it certainly can't be in that room. So then what else does that, what's the knockdown effect of that? So, um, uh, so that comes to asking what activity is being done. Singing and playing music on wind instruments are obviously quite a bit higher risk. And I imagine most people have seen the modeling on that that extends that range from six foot to 12 foot um, when you're talking about singing. Yeah, okay. So I think it also depends, you know, I have opera singer friends. I wouldn't be standing 20 feet from them. I <laughs> the front row always gets wet in the opera. <laughs> Not coming within 20 feet, you can forget it. Not even talking regularly. So um, these are just all of the new considerations. And I know it's overwhelming. And, you know, we're seeing here in the, in the chat um, all of the questions that you all have, right? Uh, but we're just going to have to move through it step by step. So when we're talking about seating for Trinity, what we're looking at is, you know, a center aisle, a right aisle, a left aisle. You have a door that you come in from the outside that takes you directly to the door that takes you to that aisle and you only come and go via that aisle. And much like if you've ever been to a, a Catholic church and someone stands at the end of that aisle to tell you that it's your turn to go up and get communion, 
I imagine we're looking at attendants who will be standing at the end of the aisle telling you it's your turn to exit that space. And then you'll probably be fully leaving. Um, or if you're lucky enough to have a large outdoor space, going outside where you'll be standing at a large distance from each other um, to, to do what I call shouting at each other from the lawn, which is what I do with friends right now. So Therese is asking, how do you sanitize carpet? Yeah, that comes back to the misting spray. So we'll let our, um, our cleaning friends talk to you about misting sprays. Uh, do we still I, pray, together? We still pray <laughs> together? I pray together with my congregation every night at six. Yes. And we do it on Zoom. Uh, we've got remarkable worship ha happening in my church, but it's not in my building. Yeah, and I don't think that's going away. Uh, I imagine that even when there is physical church service, it will now also be duly offered either at the same time or in a separately recorded version, um, because I think there are many people who may choose not to return to church, and we must, as always, respect all the decisions. We must respect all the decisions everyone make that do not endanger others. Um, we are not required to respect it if it endangers others. And somebody in the chat was saying, if there's going to be assigned seating and you're in the same place every week, what about your visitors? And I, th I think that's real. Um, yeah. I'm wondering too whether the, whether we're going to have visitors under these conditions or whether we're just going to keep encouraging them to come in and join us in whatever online worship that, that we're doing. And, and we I've stopped calling our online worship virtual, by the way. I've decided it's real. It's just a different mode. But it's not, we're not worshiping virtually. We're worshiping. Not God only, is with us. Not only is it real, it is inviting new people in who previously did not go. Um, I, my attendance is going up. For some people, it has removed barriers of attendance, whether that barrier was um, people or time or children or whatever. Mm. Some people, online worship has removed those barriers. So, yeah. 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 Uh, let's uh, have a look at the next slide. I'm not sure, I'm so not sure what's next. This, oh, is, a, yeah. this is a, a plan of the sanctuary in the church that I serve at Forest Hill United Church. Mm -hmm. So this church normally seats uh, 180, 190, we can squeeze five people into each one of those pews and there's 17 on each side, so you do the math. I asked uh, uh, one of the guys on our property committee is a retired draftsman, so I asked him to take his plans, which are professionally drawn to scale, and draw six, feet, six foot circles around them so we could see how many individuals we could squeeze into our 180 seat sanctuary. We ended up with 22. We've got one aisle, as you can see, not even six feet wide, that runs down the center. So people are going to have to come in through the back door and out through the front door. And that's how many people we can have in a single worship service in our space until the social distancing is over, which is sobering for me. Yes. So if you have multiple aisles and you look at the drawing we have here, what we've been looking at is seating the ends and then a blank and then the middle and then the ends and a blank and the middle if you get what i'm saying yeah. so you get on a pew you get four seated very far apart a blank pew two a blank pew four a blank pew and so on and so on um so that's kind of what we've been looking at right now but that is with additional aisles so that you're not all accessing that central aisle. No. Uh, and yes, of course, the question of family groups. This is why we're looking at sort of establishing seating pods based on our knowledge of the current congregation. And then basically the current congregation sits where they sit. And then yes, of course, there will be visitor spots. And those visitor spots, I rather suspect, should be at the back near the aisle because they tend to be the sneak-ins who <laughs> come in at the last minute to uh, to test something out. Sure. No, I think I think that's all important, uh, but we also may have a hard cap. Yep. Um, when I was going into Home Depot last week, the hard cap was fifty. They yep. could have fifty customers, whether they came in in pairs or as individuals. Mm -hmm. The person at the door was not counting pods, they were counting individuals. Yep. So we will probably be licensed in the same way when our turn comes, and we'll be told how many we can have. I can imagine this for a small funeral. Mm -hmm. I did a funeral two weeks ago in the funeral home, and they had 10 chairs in the chapel, and they were all six feet apart. 
filled the chapel actually it was a fairly small chapel but there was room in that chapel for 10 chairs and, and the Ontario regulations right now allow for 10 people at a funeral or the, so I guess they had nine chairs because then I was there too the funeral home staff stayed outside so that was how uh, uh, that's how they were doing the funeral home chapel and I'm imagining ours will be treated the same way when our turn comes um, and I'm, I'm imagining that this would be adequate for a small funeral or a very small wedding. Um, I'm having trouble imagining Sunday morning this way, but I'm sure there will be churches who want to do it. Would it be possible to have an overflow room where people can listen to the worship service being broadcast? Yes. Draw circles over that plan too. Um, I've got a parlor where I can put another 12 as long as I remove all the furniture. <laughs> so it's possible, but you know, if I were coming to church for Sunday morning and couldn't get into the sanctuary, wouldn't I rather just stay home and watch it on YouTube? Yeah, and I don't so know whether I'd want to sit in an overflow room. Someone here has asked, how will you choose the 22 people to attend? I don't think you will. I think it will probably be either on a first come first serve basis or maybe on a sign up basis at first. We're not talking about worship as you experience it right now, not right now, before this, in the before times. Um, this is a, a different experience and um, I, I understand how hard it is to imagine, but we need to keep people safe. So the United Church um, tendency for a completely open offering that is for everyone all the time has to have some caveats right now. So Diane is saying, do we, does someone stand outside and turn people away? Yes. Yes. Because otherwise we'll get closed down. Yes. But perhaps what we say is come back two hours from now because we're doing it all again. Perhaps we're going to multi offer multiple services. So, you know, if I have my Pentecostal service at three, maybe I'm doing a service at nine and at 1030 and at noon in order to get my whole congregation into the building in 22 person chunks maybe i don't know this is these are questions we have to ask and as ministry leaders we have to sit down and noodle them through with our board members we can't do this on our own but we need to know the water we're swimming in so that we can start thinking about it in my daughter's church in st louis uh, they're starting to talk about this and uh, they're dividing it up by the alphabet so if your last name starts with the first half of, half of the alphabet you come on the first and third sundays of the month Yep. And if, you if your last name starts in the second half, you come on the second and fourth. Now, do we want to do that? I don't know. But that's what they're doing in her church. She lives in St. Louis. Yeah, and I'm hearing the comment that you can't have multiple services. This exposes our leadership to unreasonable risk and goes against the public health rules. In Ontario right now, we can't do anything. So uh, uh, this is all uh, theoretical. And I think that the question of how to protect employees from public health risk is real. So when we're talking about this uh, at Trinity and talking about how we might manage it, in actual fact, our, our worship leader is up on our stage because that's what we have as a stage. So is actually at quite a distance, unfortunately. And, and somebody on the Zoom chat here is pointing out, yes, the sanctuary would have to be fully cleaned between services. Yeah. So if our services are 45 minutes long, that gives us probably half an hour to clean before the next people start coming in. This yep. is, we're not going back to 2019. No. And, and so the health insurance, the health people are inviting us to think outside the box and imagine a new normal. Yeah, and I ask you at this time as well to think about uh, your employees, your cleaning employees and how you, um, protect them and work with them and how you uh, pay them and assess risk. Yeah, and that's one of the topics I'm hoping we will address in next week's webinar. I'm looking for a, an HR professional who can talk to us about managing risk for our employees. So if there's someone online who has that expertise, let me know, otherwise I'm, I've got a few other leads as well. But, but yes, Right now, we're talking about how to manage the needs of our parishioners and visitors uh, and our tenants. But, but yes, there's a whole other constellation of things we need to do to manage the risk on our, on our church employees. I also encourage you to do some uh, careful reading of good sources about the difference between airborne particles and touch surfaces. So um, there is a difference there. So uh, I am not the expert, but please take the time to do some of your own reading of good sources on that. 
Yes, I agree, Mary Jo. It's especially important for our worship leaders who are part of the vulnerable class. It hit me between the eyes that I turned 60 this week, and so I fall into that class. Uh, some people are saying people who are over 65 shouldn't come to church at all. It's too risky. Maybe we wouldn't have to worry about having 22 spots if all the people over 65 took, away, took, <laughs> took a pass, right? But Kendra's um, acknowledgement is right. The, those of us who are in that vulnerable group don't often think of ourselves that way. How about yep. clergy over 65? Yeah. Yep. And if you want some entertainment, have a look at uh, priests with water guns this week. Someone mentioned baptism here. Um, there has been some inventive baptisms happening with, with water guns um, at, at a suitable distance right now. So it makes for quite entertaining pictures, I have to say. Yeah. So I want to pause here because of the angst in the chat. And, yeah. and it's huge, and it is for me too. And I want to reiterate again that the church is not a building. And that there are incredibly creative and powerful and spiritually nourishing expressions of church happening all across our nation and all across our denomination. And that whatever we do with our buildings, we must continue to be the church. That's what God calls us to be. It just may be that we use our buildings for different purposes. Maybe we'll use our buildings for small funerals and for counseling sessions. Maybe we won't use them for Sunday morning worship because the Sunday morning worship is more vital and more alive online than it could possibly be if you only put 22 people who can't sing into the, into the sanctuary. Maybe we'll do something totally different with church school online. Maybe there are, this is going to push us into being church in radical new ways. I remember reading somewhere that prior to the Reformation, you had no congregational singing. And if you had been, if you had not lived through that change, you would not recognize the church from 100 years before. It's just the ways of worshiping change to meet the times. And we have to be responsive to the context we live in as well as God's call. So the church is who we are, says Doris. It's not where we meet. Darn right. And that's part of what the challenge is. On the other hand, sometimes the building helps pay the bills. Sometimes we need to figure out not only how to address the spiritual needs, but how to make sure that the staff get paid. And if the tenants help to do that, then we have to take care of the tenants. And I, I challenge you to, um, there has been a bit of a habit to suggest that um, church things don't fall within the regulations. They, they do fall within the regulations. If, if you're asking if you fall within the regulation, you, you do. Um, you are still a public gathering and whether it's a communion or a funeral, it is still a public gathering. And um, we know this is challenging, but you, you want to keep people safe, right? So mm -hmm. one of the cool. questions here that we had was about summer camp. I don't think we have any answers right now about summer camps in most of the provinces. Um, and please feel free to correct me if your province has had specific directions, but most of what I've seen has been quite vague right now. So we, we await better direction on summer camps and, and their relationship then to our buildings. Yeah. And Dr. Strang was really helpful in today's webinar. He kept saying, we can look at this as a set of restrictions or we can look at it as an opportunity. Maybe it's time to rethink what it means to be church. What are we for? Why are we doing it? Who are we serving? How are we addressing the spiritual needs of our community right now? Do we need a building to do that? They didn't have church buildings in Jesus' day. Maybe we need to be thinking about church in totally different ways. The question has been asked twice, Stephen, what does fully clean mean? I'm not going to attempt to cover that here. I think you probably need to have a look online about uh, infection protocols and also the cleaning company that's coming on in a minute will have their own thoughts about that as well. Sure. I think that's important. And we'll save a couple of those questions like the one about how you clean carpets. And I see Vince has arrived and I think Ken has too. So we'll, uh, we'll wind up with your slides in just a minute to Kendra and then invite them to come and join us. Sure. That might be all. Let's have a quick look. But oh, I think you wanted to ask to talk about yeah. contact tracing. Contact tracing and reporting. So, will you be keeping lists of who has been in the building? We certainly will be. 
who was responsible for those right now because of our number of user groups i'm actually looking at requiring each group to sign in on free eventbrite for every event so that i always have a digital list of who was in the building with their email addresses so that we're not passing pens to and fro um who are you to notify public health in Ontario, but I don't know who else you might want to notify in the event of a known case and how do your phone trees work in that regard? How will you know why others have been in the building if that occurs? Stephen, go I ahead. Think if there's a known case, then, then it's likely the public health authorities will phone the church and say, we're aware that somebody uh, uh, walked through your building on X day. Can you tell us who else was there? And you need to be able to say, yes, I sure can. Here they are and here's their phone numbers. Yeah, but in the opposite direction, if you know of a case before public health knows of a case, <laughs> mm -hmm. which sometimes happens with uh, ministers and pastoral care, uh, that would go in the other direction. Uh, how will you let all your constituents know of the new protocols? So what are the various ways that you are going to communicate the prot protocols? And how will you communicate um, the uh, uh, actions that you will take in the event that the protocols are not followed? So. Trinity St. Paul's is looking at the requirement to wear masks and to sanitize your hands and to uh, be signed in along with an email address for all events in the building. And then, uh, as I said, one chance for groups to do that properly. And then if they don't, their booking will just have to be canceled. Mm -hmm. Matthew is asking, how do you deal with confidential counseling sessions or people seeking assistance who don't want their names recorded? You don't have to meet them in person. If they, if they want to talk to you and they're not prepared to come into the building under the conditions that the building has set, you can meet with them on the phone or by Zoom. Now, it can be entirely confidential and you don't have to keep a record of it. But we need to have, we would be required to have clearly policed protocols for keeping people safe. And not only is that because we have to follow public health regulations, but because it's the Christian thing to do to live with compassion and take, take care of people. It's our moral duty as well as our, our civic duty to do that. We had a question about housing insecure who may not have email addresses or phones. Indeed, we deal with this a lot at Trinity. Uh, what we were actually doing even before we closed down, this sounds a little crazy, but it actually was working, was requesting street corners. Mm -hmm. So um, they tend to have places where they are consistently. So whatever name they chose to give us, give us and the street corner or the shelter that they aligned with the most was about what we were able to do on the contact tracing for that. And our uh, all of our church people actually have been working to make the reusable masks that will be when we when and if we reopen, we'll be handing out to our street involved people to take with them. Some people are asking about AA in terms of registering names. Um, yep. We have an AA group that meets in my church. They're meeting online right now. So they are somehow handling the fact that, that they want to stay anonymous and also meet using a tool like Zoom. Uh, but my connections with AA are quite willing to share their first names and, and even phone numbers. So we, we don't have to be able to tell public health everything. We just need to tell public health how to reach somebody who's in, in danger. Yep. So and if I say Kendra was here and this is her phone number, that's enough for public health. They don't need to know what her last name was. Yep. And we can also use the protocols we use for uh, emergency uh, public health information. So that list can come to us in a sealed envelope that we sign the back of dated. Then it stays at your front desk and it only gets used in the event of an outbreak that relates to that date, right? So then you're not actually seeing the list of the people who were there. Helpful questions on the chat. And I think we could take another 10 minutes or so just to kind of see uh, what else emerges as Kendra and I have talked before we go over to Vince and Ken. So having heard, the, and I, I apologize, we got more questions than answers, right? But having heard her take and mine on the, the water we're swimming in right now, what's coming to mind for you? Oh, you had so many comments, Stephen, to you directly. I asked. shut them up, didn't I? <laughs> <laughs> oh, such a lively conversation before then. You know what? It's interesting. My, my husband handed me a question over my shoulder, and I had not thought of this. Confidential conversations. So what happens if you are having a confidential conversation with someone who reveals that they are infected and they don't want it made known? What happens then? Where does this come into line 
I rather suspect, Stephen, this comes into the same line as if someone had revealed to you that someone was being abused, but I don't know. I don't know what the law says. I don't either. I know morally what I would want to do, and it's the same that I would do if somebody disclosed to me that they had been abused, and it would be to say, I am not comfortable keeping that secret, but if you want, I will go with you to report it. I will, we can do that together on the speakerphone. We will find a way to, to um, do the right thing and I'll support you in the midst of that. Public health legislation requires you to report it, says Matthew. I, that makes sense to me, I imagine it would, but how we do it is how we exercise our pastoral skill, right? Yeah. And you don't just say, oh, you shouldn't have told me, now I gotta go make a phone call you say, oh my goodness, that must be terrifying. I'm so sorry to hear your news. How are you feeling? Who have you come in contact with? How shall we let people know so that nobody else gets hurt? Would you like to be in my office while we make the phone call together? I can put us on speakerphone. I mean, there's a multitude of pastoral techniques we can use, and we're all familiar with them because we do it when somebody's been abused, that we should be using here too. Yeah. I had a question here about how we'll be opening for tenants. So there was about three questions in a row about that. So we're preparing for that now at Trinity St. Paul's. So these um, upcoming requirements of wearing masks and hand sanitizing and contact tracing are gone out to our tenants this week so that they're prepared to manage that with their staff. And what we're working on right now is when and if we are allowed to have offices open again, what the timeline of that will be. So opening earlier and closing later with shifts of people working at different hours um, in order to allow for uh, less people in the building. You also need to think about the scale of your building. When we're talking about Trinity, we're talking about 44,000 square feet. Um, so think about the scale of your, of your organization as well. Sure. A couple of people are pointing out that if somebody knows they have COVID, it means they've been tested, so the authorities know. Ah, a good point. I think that's true. I think it's also important to say if somebody wants to keep this hush hush, likely because they're afraid of punishment or they're feeling guilty. The church has been really good at making people feel guilty. But I think part of our mission in this generation is to do exactly the opposite. So if we can suss out why it is they want to keep this secret, maybe we can address those concerns and then accompany them as they try to get the help that they need and we all need from them. Someone was asking, are we not allowed to be in our offices at this time? Uh, I think it depends on where you are. So in Ontario, we're at five people or less. So my maintenance person is in every day. The restaurant that cooks out of our building who is an essential service is in every day. So only three other people are allowed at any time right now who have to basically apply to my maintenance person for access. Mm -hmm. So that's where we're at now. Obviously when we move from five to 20, that starts to get more complicated. Yeah. And somebody's talking about key control. Sounds like it's been an issue in some churches. We replaced all the keys in our church with an electronic key fob so that when somebody lost a key, we didn't have to reissue new keys to everybody. <laughs> It was expensive to start with, but it's been a godsend since. I do think key control is uh, is key. Uh, this is a good moment to remind people that it is a sort of a business, a business with a lot of volunteers and a lot of deeply connected people. But um, yeah, that keys can't be floating around used in a casual way. Um, and to remind people who have had a very casual relationship with the building for a long time that this is a time to exercise more care and I'm finding that's best managed by reminding them of the most vulnerable in our community and that the care we're taking is for them, right? So Anne is asking about outdoor services. Yeah, I think uh, that's a great idea. Right now they're not allowed in Ontario. Uh, there's been some talk about them maybe being allowed in Alberta. Yep. Ontario is allowing drive-in services if you've got a big parking lot, as long as nobody gets out of their car. Mm -hmm. um, it may be that outdoor services will be allowed, but I think we're going to have a heavy job on our hands to keep people physically distant. Yep. I do an outdoor service at my church every year. It's a party. Mm -hmm. And... Uh, uh, even if people were setting up their chairs six feet apart, it's going to be hard to keep them that far apart from each other. So let's be, uh, uh, let's be cautious 
about that. And let's be clear that everybody understands that even if we're outside, the rules can't be relaxed. Yeah, New Brunswick, apparently they're allowed. And New Brunswick has almost no cases right now. So it's a very different setting than, than Quebec or Ontario where, where we have huge sections of the province that are um, um, still very hot spots. Mm. Tina, I think you're right. You can be in the church alone. We can be in the church as long as there's no more than five people there. Yep. As long as we're practicing social distancing. Yeah, so and I encourage you actually. The church. We, the church can't be open for business, but you can go in and do the photocopying and change the sign, and that's that's just fine. You can even go in and lead a worship service from the sanctuary. And that was clarified quite early on. We originally thought that we weren't supposed to. We got clarification that we could, as long as we the people doing that were socially distanced, and as long as there weren't more than five doing it. And I encourage you to not leave your building alone, right? This is not a time to leave your building alone. Um, someone should be coming in and out, I would say, at least every third day. We have an antique heating system in my building. It's an ancient 1940s steam heat system, and it springs leaks. We've got somebody going in there inspecting every day because the expense of repairing it, if the leak had been going for a week or a month, would be catastrophic. Yes, That's sir. allowed. There you go, we just had a spring clean in the church and people were trying to social distance and were wearing masks, but there was still a lot of getting too close. And they were not also using not also not using COVID-19 effective cleaners in all cases. It's a, a heavy burden, guys. Um, we, we feel your pain, um, your desire to be together and to be generous and kind with each other combined with the desire to keep people safe is a, a, a incredibly difficult dichotomy. So I want to keep reminding us, we are called to be the church. We have this weird way of using that word that sometimes means the people and sometimes means the building. We are called to be the people of God. The building is a tool that we use in order to exercise our ministry. And because it's in our care, we have to have good stewardship of it and the people who use it. But we are called to be the church. We are called to be God's holy people, addressing the spiritual struggles of the generation we find ourselves in. I encourage you all to think again about your usage pattern as well and uh, how long it's going to be between people uh, leaving and arriving again. And, and also to say that Stephen and I both intended today to be the beginning of a conversation. Yes. And uh, were we confident to provide you with recommendations on precisely what you should do, we would have done so. Um, we're just starting the conversations with Vince, with uh, UCC, with all kinds of groups about what we might recommend long term. Yeah, I think, I think that's really important. And and also to acknowledge the advice we got from public health, which was, gee, you're starting this conversation awfully early, which is a sobering response right there. Um, we're in this for the long haul and we are imagining new ways to be church and new obligations to being landlords. And that's tough. One of my tenants said to me this week, there are more things we don't know than we do know. So uh, let us work together to learn together and to problem solve together and to recognize that there are uh, no experts. There is only collective wisdom and assessing sources and then looking to the best experts when we get down to it and we're not there yet. Here's an important comment from Alexandra in the Zoom chat. She says, I'm thinking about the emotional impact of bringing people back into a church space that cannot operate the way they've been longing for over the pandemic period. It might be useful to push back returning to the sanctuary for worship until that experience could be possible in a safe way. That's what I'm thinking too. And so my imaginings are going into how do I make sure that it's safe for the kids coming into the daycare? Because I am thinking Sunday morning, we're gonna be worshiping on Zoom for a while yet and maybe only doing a small funeral or a small uh, wedding in the sanctuary. 
that's but again, that's just where I'm at, right? I'm 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 a minister, not an expert. <laughs> We've come to the end of our time. And, and I want to thank Kendra. I want to thank Vince. I want to thank each of you. My goodness, we've had almost 300 people part of this on Zoom or on YouTube. And it reminds me how close to our heart our buildings are, how close to our people's hearts our buildings are, uh, and how much we want to keep people safe and also do the ministry that we are called to do. Thank you for your attention. Thank you for starting the conversation. Join us next week, I hope, as long as the leadership gets in place, to talk about what worship might look like in September, in October. Uh, do we worship in our sanctuaries and not sing? What would music look like? Do we stay on Zoom? In what case, in which case, how do we shift from this is a temporary thing to this is our new normal for a while? Some of those kinds of things we want to talk about next week, and I hope some of the HR questions around how do we keep our employees safe and what are our obligations as as uh, employers. Those are the things we're we're wrestling with, and um, as long as the leaders fall into place the way they did this week, we'll be back uh, with with that topic next Thursday afternoon. Thanks for joining us, and uh, we're going to sign off now. Bye bye all. <laughs>